the day we see Starship fly with Raptor 3 is closer than ever. Lately, space enthusiasts have spotted hints that the Raptor 3 vacuum engine is finally starting to emerge. What makes this engine so special? Let's take a closer look. Some people who are not really into space science often think that a vacuum engine is just a bigger designed engine, but the science behind it is much more beautiful than that. Rocket nozzles are most efficient when the exhaust gases expand just enough to match the ambient pressure at the moment they exit the nozzle. At sea level, where atmospheric pressure is relatively high, the exhaust doesn't need to expand much before it equalizes with the surrounding environment. In contrast, the vacuum of space has virtually no ambient pressure, so the exhaust gases must expand significantly more. This additional expansion allows for greater efficiency as more energy can be extracted from the same amount of propellant. In theory, the most efficient nozzle in a perfect vacuum would be infinitely long to fully harness this expansion. But of course, that's not physically feasible. As a rocket ascends, atmospheric pressure decreases gradually, and so the optimal nozzle shape changes continuously with altitude. At lower altitudes, nozzles are designed to be smaller to match the higher surrounding pressure, ensuring efficient exhaust expansion. If the gases exit the nozzle at a pressure higher than the ambient pressure, the nozzle is considered underexpanded, leading to a loss in thrust efficiency. The Raptor vacuum engine must also adhere to this principle. The original Raptor vacuum featured an extended nozzle with a diameter of approximately 2.3 meters. Since the diameter of Starship remains unchanged, the Raptor 3 vacuum's extension nozzle diameter is also expected to stay the same. To protect the extended nozzle, SpaceX employs a technique known as regenerative cooling. This is the most common method used to prevent liquid-fueled rocket engines from overheating or melting. This approach involves rooting some or all of the propellant through channels built into the walls of the combustion chamber and nozzle before it reaches the injectors. Although these engine walls may appear thin, they contain intricate cooling channels that circulate the cryogenic fuel. In the case of the Raptor engine, the use of liquid methane and liquid oxygen, both cryogenic propellants, makes regenerative cooling especially effective. Now, let's get to the part that everyone is excited about, specifications. Raptor 1 delivered a thrust of 185 tons, already a remarkable engineering feat. Raptor 2 pushed that number to 230 tons, and the latest Raptor 3 takes it even further, reaching an impressive 280 tons of thrust. That is a 95-ton increase over just two iterations, an extraordinary leap in a relatively short time. However, when comparing rocket engines' thrust density, which is the amount of thrust generated per unit of exit area, provides a more accurate measure of performance. The sea level and vacuum versions of Raptor 1 did not lead in this category, as the Space Shuttle main engines and SLS boosters offered higher thrust density at the time. With the introduction of Raptor 2, and now Raptor 3, SpaceX has taken the lead. Thanks to increased thrust and a largely unchanged exit area, these newer Raptors now rank as the most powerful engines by thrust density. It is also important to note that despite the larger appearance of the vacuum-optimized Raptor 3, its thrust is only slightly higher. This is because the expanded nozzle is not meant to increase raw power, but rather to improve specific impulse in the vacuum of space, enhancing fuel efficiency instead of maximizing thrust. The Raptor 3 vacuum is expected to achieve a specific impulse between 378 and 380 seconds. With this combination of thrust and efficiency, it significantly outperforms many of its competitors. For example, the vacuum-optimized BE-4 engine reaches only 339 seconds, and the RD-180 achieves 338 seconds in vacuum. Even the iconic RS-25 engine from the space shuttle, which reaches 452 seconds of specific impulse, relies on a complex dual combustion chamber design to do so. 
Currently, a fully stacked Starship features 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy Booster first stage and six engines on the second stage. Of these, three are sea-level engines optimized for maximum thrust in Earth's atmosphere, while the other three are Raptor vacuum engines designed for space. This brings the total number of Raptors on the full stack to 39. However, in future iterations, SpaceX plans to add three more Raptor vacuum engines, raising the total to 42. Fun fact, Elon Musk has often referenced the number 42 as the answer to life, the universe, and everything. A nod to the sci-fi classic, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In that spirit, when he founded the AI company XAI on July 12, 2023, he pointed out that the digits of the launch date add up to 42. The appearance of the Raptor 3 vacuum engine suggests that SpaceX is accelerating the development and testing of the new design. One possible reason is the ongoing challenges with Starship Block 2 and the current Raptor 2 vacuum engines. During Flight 8, a fuel line leak led to a fire in the engine bay, resulting in the explosion of a Raptor 2 vacuum engine. If Raptor 3 replaces it, the shift from a traditional heat shield to an integrated cooling system could offer a key advantage. Any gas leaks would simply vent into the already superheated plasma surrounding the engines, eliminating the risk of fire and making such leaks far less hazardous. While SpaceX hasn't announced an exact date for when the Raptor 3 and Raptor 3 vacuum engines will enter service, they're expected to debut around the same time as the introduction of Booster V2. Unlike its predecessors, Booster V2 will feature a permanently attached hot staging ring rather than a jettisonable one. This new ring is taller and designed similarly to the one used on Russia's Soyuz rocket, allowing for more efficient heat dissipation. In addition, the grid fins will be relocated lower on the booster, farther from the upper stage engines, to minimize heat exposure during the hot staging process. The first Booster V2 is expected to be Booster 18. However, the timeline remains uncertain. Although Boosters 16 and 17 have yet to fly, SpaceX also has two previously flown and recovered Boosters 14 and 15 that could be reflown. With Flight 9 set to feature the flight of Booster 14, it is possible that SpaceX will continue using V1 boosters until the Raptor 3 engines are ready. The arrival of the Raptor 3 vacuum is certainly something to look forward to. But did you know that SpaceX is developing a new engine for multi-planet missions? But first, we're halfway to our goal of 5,000 subscribers. If you enjoy this content, consider subscribing to help us reach the milestone. Thanks. In a LinkedIn post, a guy named Sunad Gurajada announced that he is joining a SpaceX engineering team to help develop a new turbo pump from scratch for a crucial new system that will enable all Starship missions beyond low Earth orbit, including the Moon and Mars. The new turbo pump could be for the Raptor 4 engine that Elon has been talking about from time to time. It could also be for specialized propulsion systems for landing in low-gravity environments, like the lunar version of Starship. The Starship Human Landing System, HLS, developed by SpaceX as part of NASA's Artemis program, is designed to transport astronauts and cargo from the lunar gateway to the surface of the moon. Unlike other Starship variants, HLS will be equipped with hot gas thrusters specifically for lunar landings. When descending to within 100 meters of the lunar surface, it will switch to high-thrust landing engines located in the mid-body section to avoid plume impingement with the lunar regolith. These engines burn gaseous oxygen and methane rather than the liquid versions used by the Raptor engines. Electrical power for the vehicle is provided by a ring of solar panels wrapped around its circumference. HLS will also have the capability to loiter in lunar orbit for up to 100 days. Musk speaks about this engine on X. Forward thrusters are to stabilize ship when landing in high winds. If the goal is to max payload to the moon per ship, no heat shield or flaps or big gas thruster packs are needed. No need to bring early ships back. They can serve as part of Moon Base Alpha, 
A mock-up of the HLS nose cone is currently on display in the Rocket Garden at Starbase, repurposed from the nose cone of Ship 22. While no full-scale tests of the HLS have taken place yet, early prototypes may be on the horizon and several components have already undergone testing elsewhere. According to Lisa Watson Morgan, NASA's HLS program manager, the development of Starship version 3 will enable key tests such as propellant transfer and cryogenic fluid management. This version will incorporate new docking systems and fluid couplers essential for deep space missions. Extensive ground testing has already been completed and NASA is actively working with SpaceX to ensure that crew systems meet safety and operational requirements. Long-duration flight demonstrations and in-orbit refueling tests are scheduled for 2025 and will be critical in proving Starship's ability to dock, transfer propellant, and support future lunar missions. It's encouraging to see real progress towards returning to the moon, but if we view this as a new space race, then the pace needs to accelerate if we don't want to fall behind. Recent developments show that China is rapidly advancing its lunar ambitions. According to a presentation by a senior official, China is considering building a nuclear power plant on the moon to support the International Lunar Research Station, ILRS, a joint project with Russia. China aims to become a major space power with plans to land astronauts on the moon by 2030. The upcoming Chang'e 8 mission, scheduled for 2028, will lay the groundwork for a permanent, crewed lunar base. In a presentation in Shanghai, Pei Zhao Yu, the mission's chief engineer, revealed that the lunar base could also be powered by large-scale solar arrays with pipelines and cables for heating and electricity laid across the moon's surface. China's timeline for building an outpost at the moon's south pole closely aligns with NASA's Artemis program, which aims to return American astronauts to the lunar surface by December 2025. A basic model of the ILRS centered on the lunar south pole is expected to be completed by 2035. Looking further ahead, China plans to launch the 555 project, inviting 50 countries, 500 international scientific research institutions, and 5,000 overseas researchers to participate in the ILRS. At the same conference, researchers from Russia's Roscosmos shared plans to explore the moon for mineral and water resources with the possibility of using lunar material as fuel. China has rapidly evolved from a relatively modest aerospace player into one of the world's leading space powers. In fact, a 2022 Pentagon report projected that China could surpass U.S. space capabilities as early as 2045. And China isn't alone. Other nations are also making significant strides in space exploration. The United Arab Emirates became the fifth country to reach Mars with its Hope Probe, while India recently became the fourth nation to successfully land a spacecraft on the moon and the first to do so near the lunar south pole. This renewed push to return to the moon is not just about advancing space science. It is also about preserving U.S. leadership in a rapidly evolving and increasingly competitive domain.